Welcome to 20th Century Music and Arts. In today's episode, we're going to look at four albums of Black Sabbaths from the 1970s that were significant and influential. Sabbath continued to tour extensively in 1971 and would fly to Australia to headline a show at the Maiponga Pop Festival on February 1st of that year. They had gotten rid of manager Jim Simpson and had taken on Patrick Meehan instead. They flew back to England to record their next album with Roger Bain again. The album was recorded in two different sessions, from February 7th to 15th and from April 6th to the 13th. Iommi's finger still hurt when he played, so he down his guitar by a step and a half in order to make the strings looser. Geezer did the same tuning on his bass. The result of this downtuning was the creation of a sound that continues to influence heavy music to this day. There was no presence of reverb here, just a dark, gloomy sound that would be integral to the sound of Seattle grunge bands two decades later. The resulting album was Master of Reality. The album opens up with a coughing sound on a repeated loop. Then the down get riff kicks in. Sweet Leaf is Sabbath's ode to the marijuana that they had been ritually smoking during the recording sessions. The entire genre of stoner rock slash metal gets invented right here. Though the title of the song may have been taken from an Irish cigarette brand. The next track is After Forever. Now, Sabbath had been associated with things like Satanism and devil worship due to the contents of the song, especially on the first album, and the imagery that they had played around with. But the clear fact was that none of the members worshipped Lucifer and in fact were just four working class blokes who did grow up going to church. So Geezer Butler, who was a sort of lapsed Catholic, wrote a very pro-Christian song that admonishes those who look down at the belief in God. The song states vehemently that you should realize before you criticize that God is the only way to love. The lyrics of this song should have been shown to all the fundamentalist preachers who went after Sabbath for devil worship. Iommi gets the opportunity to show off his acoustic guitar picking skills on the short instrumental track Embryo. This is followed by the hard charging and driven Children of the Grade. This track foreshadows the playing style of the 80s speed and thrash metal bands. Ward shows off some incredible drumming on the track, and the lyrics deal with young people protesting in the streets. The song ends with haunting spooky sounds. On the US release, this section of the song was known as The Haunting. We are back to Iommi's acoustic finger picking on Orchid, which is followed by the heavy and muscular sounding Lord of This World. Then Ozzy and company compose their first ballad, Solitude. Not a great love ballad, but an absolute melancholy tune with Ozzy singing about a girl who left him and is drenched in eerie flute playing. The album ends with the absolutely doomy yet dynamic Into the Void, which has one of the heaviest riffs ever composed by the band. The down tuned guitar takes center stage here, and there's even a lead guitar break that resembles the one from Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love. The band really shows their musical development on this album, and it is quite short and clocks in at 34 minutes and 29 seconds. Out of all the Sabbath albums, this one is my personal favorite. The album was very successful, peaking at number 5 on the UK charts and number 8 on the US charts. But the critics were still not kind to Black Sabbath. Robert Kreisgau from The Village Voice called it a dim-witted, amoral exploitation. But the crowds wanted to see Black Sabbath. And the band would go on to tour from July 1971 all the way to April 9th, 1972. The band played in the US, Canada, Puerto Rico, UK, Germany, Australia, the Netherlands, Denmark, Italy, and Japan. And the drugs and the partying were getting out of control. The band were not just into pot, but cocaine, various pills like uppers and downers, and quaaludes, and of course there was alcohol. Exhausted at the end of touring, Sabbaths decided to take their time with the next album. There were a few differences this time. First of all, the band decided to record the album at the recording plant in Los Angeles. 
The second thing was that Tony Iommi took on the role of producer, along with manager Patrick Meehan as co-producer, but he really didn't do much. One of the issues was that Los Angeles in 1972 was awash in cocaine. In fact, the album cost 60000 to produce, but the band actually spent 75000 on cocaine. In fact, Ozzy tells a story of doing coke at a poolside while talking to a man in a suit. When Ozzy asked the man what he did for a living, the man informed him that he worked for the DEA. A panicked Osborne looked up and the man responded, Don't worry, I'm the one who got you the coke. Other incidents happened as well. In a drug-fueled haze caused by the ingestion of LSD, Geezer Butler tried to jump out of a hotel window and had to be restrained by the others. When Bill Ward passed out drunk and naked, the other members thought it would be funny to spray paint him gold which caused Ward to go into convulsions as his pores were now all sealed up. The ambulance driver informed the band that they had nearly killed Ward. But despite all the indulgences and insanity, the band actually produced a masterpiece titled Volume 4. The time in the studio allowed the band to really push their vision and possibilities. Many critics have argued that this is where the band hit their peak. The sound of the album has a higher level of production and Iomi made use of overdubs to create multiple tracks. The album starts out with the 8 minute epic Wheels of Confusion, which takes the listener through all kinds of dynamic twists and turns. As Henry Rollins states about the lyrics, it's about alienation and being lost in the wheels of confusion, which is the way I find myself a lot of the time. Next is Tomorrow's Dream, which continues with the same riff-heavy, filled melancholy. While staying at the mansion in Bel Air, Iomi taught himself how to play the piano by playing the one that was in the house. This became the basis for arguably Sabbath's first true ballad, Changes. The song consists of piano, melantron, a little bass, and Ozzy's vocals. I remember that this song was actually quite popular in South Korea, and it does not have that typical Sabbath sound at all. The next track's FX is just echoey feedback that was the result of Iomi's cross that he wore around his neck hitting the guitar strings. Supernaut is definitely the highlight of the album. This song is the musical equivalent of an earthquake. It has an awesome Latin-inspired drum bait played by Ward, in the middle of the song, and the way that Iomi catches the riff at the end of the drum solo is absolutely incredible. This song was a favorite of both Frank Zappa and John Bonham of Led Zeppelin. Zappa wanted to jam with Sabbath, but never got the chance to. Led Zeppelin did jam with Sabbath at one point during the recording of their next album, and Bonham wanted to play Supernaut, but instead they just jammed on various sounds, I guess. I really hope there are tapes of this jam that will get released. After Supernaut, there is an homage to the cocaine addiction that took over all the members of the band. Snowblind. Riff heavy cornucopia follows next, and then Iomi shows off his acoustic playing on the instrumental Laguna Sunrise. The short, almost playful sounding Saint Vitus dance is after, and then the album closes with the complex and epic heaviness of Under the Sun. The album reached number 8 in the UK and number 13 on the US charts, and the critics were starting to come around. Lester Banks, who had once been very dismissive of the band, stated, we have seen the Stooges take on the night ferociously and go out tumbling into the maw. And Alice Cooper is currently exploiting it for all it's worth and turning it into a circus. But there's only one band that's dealt with it honestly on terms meaningful to vast portions of the audience. Not only grappling with it in a mythic structure that's both personal and powerful, but actually managing to prosper as well. And that band is is Black Sabbath. But the lifestyle of excess was really catching up with the band. Iomi, after being up for days on cocaine and being stabbed during the sound check by a religious fanatic, collapsed on stage at a show at the Hollywood Bowl. The band's tour was long and it went from June 19th, 1972 until March 18th, 1973. 
The band went back to California to try and recreate the magic from Volume 4. But the band was so burnt out from touring and substance abuse, no ideas were coming to anyone, especially Iomi, who had clearly become the de facto leader. So the band went to the Clearwell Castle in Gloucestershire, England, to write their next album. Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, and Mott the Hoople all wrote albums there. The spooky location really rejuvenated the band, but it also led to some serious, scary moments. Iomi stated, We rehearsed in the armory there, and one night I was walking down the corridor with Ozzy, and we saw this figure in a black cloak. We followed this figure back into the armory, and there was absolutely no one there, and whoever it was had disappeared into thin air. And the people that owned the castle knew all about this ghost, and they said, Oh yes, that's the ghost of so-and-so, and we were like, What? Many of the encounters were also the result of the band pranking each other. These pranks included Osborne hiding a tape recorder of strange sounds under Iomi's bed, Iomi hanging a dressmaker's doll out of the window when Ward and Butler were coming home from the pub, and Iomi putting a mirror in front of a sleeping Ward's face and waking him up to see Ward scream when he saw his reflection. Ward actually became so neurotic that he started sleeping with a dagger. But the atmosphere created a solid album called Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Iomi really took charge here, but he did feel resentful about the pressure he felt. He was definitely getting influence from the prog rock bands at the time. When the band went down to the Morgan Studios in London to actually record the album, Yes were recording their album Tales from the Topographic Oceans in an adjacent studio. The opening track on Sabbath, Bloody Sabbaths starts ferociously, but is the sound is counterbalanced by the melodic chorus of that self-titled track. The epic and complex A National Acrobat is next. Iomi then plays a light piece on the keyboards called Fluff, which sounds just like the name. This piece is followed by the groovy Sabra Kadabra, which rocks and makes use of keyboards again in the later half of the song, played none other than by Rick Wakeman of Yes. The use of keyboards and even strings is actually found on many of the tracks. The excellent Killing Yourself to Live starts off side two, which had a title that reflected the effect of the lifestyle that the band were engaging in. The Moog synthesizer sounds are front and center on Who Are You, which was actually composed by Osborne using the instrument that he had just purchased. Next up is the upbeat and melodic Looking for Today, which has overdubbed acoustic guitar and flute in the mix. The album ends, as usual, with an epic. Spiral Architect starts out with finger picking on an acoustic guitar, then the track gets heavy, but it also includes layers of string arrangements. This album reflects Sabbath at their most experimental, but it really works on this album. The cover brought back the dark imagery from the first album, and with a person naked in bed being harassed by demons on a bed with skull and arms and 666 written on it. The album reached number 4 in the UK and number 11 in the US, but things were continuing to crack. Iomi felt he had no social life because he was writing and composing everything, and Butler was annoyed that Osborne was so dependent on him to write lyrics. The Sabbath Bloody Sabbath tour lasted from December 9th, 1973, all the way until November 16th, 1974. It was a really long tour, and they didn't really get a chance to rest. One of the highlights was playing at the California Jam on April 6th, 1974, which they were forced to do in the middle of a rest period from that tour. They played alongside bands such as Black Oak, Arkansas, Deep Purple, and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and it was broadcasted on TV. But they hit another snag. They suspected that Patrick Meehan, their manager, was ripping them off, and quite frankly, he never gave them a straight answer when asked about how much money they were making. So they fired him, and eventually, over the next while, they would go under the management of Don Arden. More about that later. They ended up, though, getting into a long legal battle with Meehan, which would have a huge impact on the recording of the next album, Sabotage. The recording sessions took four months. They recorded the album at the Morgan Studios again, and Mike Butcher co-produced with Iomi. However, 
The recording studio had a bar where the band spent many hours. In fact, one night, Geezer Butler played a long game of darts with the Rolling Stones' Charlie Watts. But with the recording getting interrupted by court dates and lawyer meetings, anger fueled the album. The result is an album that is extremely heavy in times, but also has some lighter sections as well. The album starts out with the ripping and heavy Hole in the Sky, which starts out with the line with the words, Attack. This is followed by the brief instrumental Don't Start Too Late, which leads into Symptom of the Universe. Okay, if Children of the Grave was proto-thrash, Symptom of the Universe is thrash metal. But the track ends with an acoustic section. Next is the long and menacing Megalomania. Side 2 starts out with the melodic but still driving thrill of it all. IOE puts together an eerie experimental track called Superzar that uses the English chamber choir that sounds like it belonged on a horror movie soundtrack. Next is the mad poppiness of Am I Going Insane radio. And as the usual, the album closes with a driving epic. The writ it was all about the legal wranglings the band had to deal with. And they actually stuck a little s- piano comedy piece on the end of the track. You just have to wait for it after the writ finishes. But those legal headaches were not going away. And even though the album reached number 7 in the UK and number 28 in the US, the band had spent so much money fighting Meehan and paying taxes that they found themselves touring just to pay the bills. They toured from July 14th, 1975 until January 13th, 1976. After this tour, the band found themselves unsure of what direction they should take. Now, during the period between Master of Reality and Sabotage, there were numerous bands that were taking their cues from Sabbath. Bands such as Dust with a future Marky Ramone on drums, Highway Robbery, Three Man Army, Prime Evil, Leaf Hound, and Japan's Flower Traveling Band. Four bands that were particularly influenced by Sabbath at this time were Bang, Buffalo, Pentagram, and Necromandus. Bang were a power trio originally from Philadelphia, but were working out of Florida. They re-recorded the songs that were to go on their 1972 self-titled album, to match the influence of heavy rock, in particular Black Sabbath. Songs like Lions and Christians and The Queen off that album sound so much like an American version of Black Sabbath. Their follow-up album and their unreleased debut did not have this sound at all. So when record collectors started looking back to this band, they were only interested in the Sabbath-influenced album. The band uh, even started touring in the 2000s and still does some touring today, apparently. Today she ran her house, milking bashful fire. Buffalo out of Australia had a fierce rock sound that approached the heaviness of Sabbath, particularly on their second album, Volcanic Rock. <laughs> Now, out of Alexandria, Virginia, came a band called Pentagram, led by Bobby Bobby Liebling. They went by numerous other names like Virgin Death, Macabre, and Wicked Angel, but always came back to Pentagram. They recorded a series of demos in 1972, 74, 75, and 76 of total Sabbath-infused heaviness. Unfortunately, these recordings would not be released until the 90s and 2000s. They actually later became a force in the 1980s, being one of the bands that were part of the Sabbath-influenced doom metal genre. There'll be more on that genre in later episodes. Finally, there is Necromandus. Out of Ergamont, Cumbria, England. They formed in 1970, and in 1972, Tony Iommi took the band under his wing. He managed the band and had them open for Sabbath in 1973 on some of the British leg of the Volume 4 tour, and helped them record the 1973 album Orexis of Death, where he added some guitar parts to the title track. 
The band have a Sabbath-influenced sound, though not quite as heavy, with strong components of prog rock thrown into the mix. The album sounds like a precursor to the Canadian rock band Rush in many ways. Unfortunately, their lead guitarist Barry Baz Dunnery left, and the album ended up not getting released by Vertigo. The album was eventually put out in 1999. <laughs> Sabbath was making their mark, and as the years of the 70s went on, their influence on bands became greater, as we will see in the next few episodes. In the next episode, we are going to see a band become confused, reborn, and we're also going to see the birth of a solo career. And we are going to see more of the children that Sabbath helped create. Thank you for watching 20th Century Music and Arts. Please like subscribe, share, leave a comment. If you think I'm wrong, again, about Sabbath being the most important band, have a little argument with me in the comments. I would love it. Take care.